So yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in this uh, topic and, and to hear about you at all. So uh, at Illinois, we have a couple of um, blockchain student groups, some of which I've kind of tried to help get off the ground or, you know, tried to help. Uh, uh, it's taken different forms and, you know, people go in and out. So I think we basically had one or two blockchain groups that have started and restarted a couple of times. I've always kind of thought that this is kind of a, a missed opportunity. And so I, I've been on the lookout for, you know, good resources that could help. And it seems like your network is like uh, exactly on, on track there. So I'm quite interested in that. Um, I've also been doing, you know, quite a lot of research and trying to develop educational materials. I think I was in one of the first cohorts of people to do PhDs in computer science, primarily focusing on cryptocurrencies. Uh, and so a handful of us like Patrick McCorry and Arthur Gervais, uh, uh, yeah, and several others, we, we've done like a bunch of workshops and slides trying to explain smart contracts, explain, um, uh, yeah, all sorts of different educational materials. So I, I could go over kind of, um, you know, some set of uh, 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 stuff that I've got. And I can also tell a little bit about some of the other courses at, at UIUC. So at um, Illinois, we have a pretty big computer science department, also a big computer engineering group within the uh, EC uh, department. Um, and at, at this point now we have like at least three or four uh, profs in computer security or in related fields who have taught some form of blockchain relevant course. Uh, so it's not even just me. It's like when I joined, I had the only blockchain course. Now there's like at least four um, uh, courses on different topics here. Um, something that I'd say is all the stuff, I'll, I'll kind of go through quickly the courses that I have in mind here. Um, all of the ones that I'm aware of are really pretty specifically focused in computer science. Um, so I've done a couple. One is a computer uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain security course. Um, I haven't been maintaining this, so you can see a bunch of um, uh, slide decks and, and stuff from here, but this was more of an informal course, and, and I did this uh, a couple of years ago. There's recently a blockchain foundations course by Promode at UIUC. I think this one is an extremely interesting, uh, if I can find the, it's got to be, you know, this is his topic. Let me see if I can find the link straight to his um, syllabus here. Uh, yeah, if you bear with me, I'll do these like live Google searches and I'll find it uh, uh, eventually here, I'm sure. Um, I'm looking for foundations of blockchain technology. This is a course that's for grad students, so it's a bit advanced. Um, one of the things that's really a uh, characteristic of this course is that it is I guess that's, that's not quite it either. All right, I'll have to go look to find the exact syllabus for this. Um, but it's very hands-on and it goes through basically a, 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 like a long course project, which is designing and implementing a blockchain from scratch in Rust. And so it includes pretty detailed things like mempool and transaction management, wallets and transaction making, as well as participating in consensus protocol and peer-to-peer -peer gossip. So it's a kind of a systems oriented class, but it goes through all of the uh, uh, security topics. The thing that sounded closest to some of the stuff that you described, uh, and if I have anything here that I can share with you that's useful, feel free just to take uh, whatever you like. Um, but I did a half semester course on smart contracts and blockchain programming, basically. So a little bit of intro self-contained for blockchain security. Um, but I'm rather proud of the sequence of um, slides and programming assignments and tutorials on MetaMask. I think if I go look, I had pulled up um, yeah, your, your blockchain education and the uh, uh, getting started with ones. I actually think it goes fairly, um, like we go through like an in-class ERC-20 token, um, how to do just basic remix based uh, Solidity programming. So yeah, that's the premise of this course is like hands-on with Solidity program in the second lecture and after of that course. Um, besides the, uh, what was the other one that I wanted to point out? Uh, so promote Viswanath and ECE uh, has done a bunch of cryptocurrency things here. Uh, he was one of the authors of the Dandelion research paper on uh, uh, private gossiping in peer-to-peer -peer networks for the, the P2P layer. Um, we also have Ling Ren, who teaches the consensus protocols uh, class. He basically has a custom uh, new class. I'm sure that I'll be able to get to the nice syllabus of this from his yeah, this is in his second version of um, doing it. I think that he actually has nearly all of the, okay, well, at least a pretty detailed syllabus here. I may even just paste this link into the Zoom. I know you can see it and follow along, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So um, 
This is also aimed at grad students in computer science. So like it's super technical and it doesn't, you know, focus on like the, uh, uh, you know, intro to blockchain or usage of blockchain necessarily or the finance aspect of that. I completely agree that those are an important thing to include in like a well-balanced uh, blockchain education. But um, again, from my experience, it's mostly in the skewed like uh, deep cryptography, consensus protocols, systems, uh, or smart contract programming um, aspects of it. Um, so besides Lingren's class, this consensus algorithms class, uh, something else I could point out is that um, I have, I've been doing a cryptography course uh, so the scope of this is applied cryptography. It's not blockchain specific, but my enthusiasm for blockchain stuff comes out in the uh, curriculum here. So this is a bit unusual of a cryptography intro course for undergraduates in that it focuses relatively less than others on, um, I guess what I would call simple cryptography, like public key encryption and AES. I think normal cryptography courses focus a little bit more on just encryption and digital signatures for messages. Uh, I, I do take a different approach here where I start basically with zero knowledge proofs as the first primitive to learn, because even though we think of that as zero knowledge proofs is where moon math begins and you know ordinary cryptography ended. Uh, I think for teaching it, it's really conceptually the other way around. Zero knowledge proofs are very simple and you can build signatures out of them and uh, a whole bunch of other topics kind of become a, a more clear as refinements of some of the things introduced in zero knowledge proofs. So this isn't a, a blockchain specific course, but it's, um, you know, I think a blockchain informed take on how to do uh, undergrad education in, a, 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 in applied cryptography. I think those are the main ones that are, are courses that are blockchain related at, at, at Illinois. And I've obviously not given really any detail about these. So maybe, you know, through questions I could, uh, uh, you know, chat more about what, what goes into those or, or parts of those that you found interesting. Um, there's also, uh, you know, like formal methods in smart contracts has emerged as a really important topic. Um, at UIUC in computer science, Grigori Rosu is a pretty important researcher in the smart contract space because his uh, framework called K framework has been used for smart contract. Uh, uh, like there's a K framework model of solidity and EVM. And the K framework is basically like a platform for writing formal verification tools. So it's like a, a tool for writing formal verification tools. Um, and he has a, a startup company that you know is built out of his lab that has called Runtime Verification that has actually done quite a bunch of actual like contract analysis for blockchain startups launching tokens. They did a formal analysis under contract for Uniswap. Uh, and I, I don't know that he has a specific course. I think that I, this is just something that I had heard about and might not be there. I'd have to see whether or not I could find, um, I don't know whether he has a, a, a course that actually teaches the formal methods aspects specifically for the sake of uh, smart contracts. Uh, so maybe that's something that's more of just like a research topic that's here than a course that I can point to. So yeah, I, I'd say the courses that we have that are relevant are, are um, yeah, those ones that I've mentioned. So let me see, that, that was a long ramble. I should pause and try to be guided by questions you all have. So uh, just real quick, um, thanks thanks for that rundown, Professor Miller. And, and I'm Zane, by the way, I'm, I'm the one who kind of reached out to you initially. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, uh, through most of the courses that you ran us through, they're all pretty much focused on graduate students, correct? Uh, not entirely. The smart contracts half semester one, this one was particularly for undergraduates. Uh, and the cryptography one that I mentioned that includes some zero knowledge proofs, that's also for senior undergraduates. Uh, so at least the, the, yeah, the, the, okay. these two are the one, only ones that are not aimed at graduate students. Okay. And like, what does, what does enrollment in those courses look like? Have you seen like, has, has it been going up? Well, what does what does like student you know sentiment look like? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't have like really great numbers to support this, other than to say that uh, I haven't noticed a particular change. I mean, so um, I, I have noticed more. You know, increasingly more people are aware of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies when they're in some of these classes. I think for them to find their way into this class, they had to already be familiar with it in some way. Um, 
the size of the courses has kind of been consistently like 30 to 40 students. I think actually the smart contract half semester course initially had like 60 people. And I think even by the end of it, it was like about 40 people. So I, I don't know, in my experience so far, the class sizes are, are roughly the same despite any, you know, changes to the curriculum and pretty much despite anything, right? That's the way the, the, the volume of it goes. I think that that's in part due to the fact that we're in this like fairly large uh, uh, department. So it's really like who has the time in their schedules and there's always a consistent, you know, pool size of people to draw from. Do the courses have like uh, end of the semester projects that students work on? Uh, yeah, almost uh, without exception. I believe that um, I, I believe that the three that the smart contract class because it was only a, a half semester. We didn't do uh, formal course projects with it. All of the grad student classes have um, uh, all the grad student classes have final projects that go along with those. Maybe something that I could do is I uh, try to I have to think about it a bit and to page it in and talk about some of the projects you know, blockchain related that uh, folks have done for those courses. Um, I'm not aware of all of the projects I'd have to look into it, but it might be interesting from Ling's class and Promode's class, which are the most recent grad students. I could talk about final projects that were done in the cryptography course, several of which involved blockchain and um, uh, the ones from a you know, earlier topics course on it. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of our classes do involve final projects that are like half, do, do like a project proposal halfway through the semester, spend like six to eight weeks working on that project. Hmm. Do you see students continue the work afterwards? Um, I have in a couple of cases. I mean, I, I would actually say that, you know, so my, um, I, I feel like there's been a mismatch between, you know, my level of enthusiasm. Like, I, I think that this is, you know, the best stuff ever. I try to point out the, the programming frameworks. Like, I think programming in Solidity is awesome. It's really accessible. I think everyone should learn Solidity, if not as a first language, then as a second programming language. Uh, and I try to emphasize in my courses that um, you can learn how to write zero knowledge proofs using uh, Zocrates as my preferred snark programming language because it's really easy and, and quick to use and I can do a short demo of it in like a, a 10 minute you know, time period. So to me, even if you don't understand all of the underlying cryptography and math behind them, these like MPC programming frameworks like MP speeds and snark frameworks like Zocrates, as well as smart contract languages like Solidity and, and Remix and all the you know, test frameworks that go along with it. You can jump in and start doing a project with those even without having like a huge amount of a, a complicated math background. Um, that said, I've been somewhat disappointed with the amount of uh, enthusiasm for continuing these that I've observed in students from my you know, fairly limited vantage points experience of this. So this is something that I've been trying to think about and figure out what I, I can do that's um, you know, lowering the barriers even more. Um, but, but no, it, with a couple of exceptions, I haven't seen too many people go and carry on with these and like uh, build out their blockchain based projects into, into others. There are at least a few counter examples. Um, and I, I guess what I would say is at least a few undergraduates that I've worked with through these courses have then gone on to actually continue in, in the blockchain industry. So um, at, uh, at least one of the students from my class had gone on to start a blockchain startup seller network, which is, uh, you know, ongoing and uh, uh, viable and exists as a, a blockchain startup company. Uh, and a couple others have gone on to become like analysts at VC firms or uh, otherwise work as a, a you know, technical work within a blockchain company. But to me, there's an unidentified gap. So I mean, my, my perception is that these are, are more exciting and, and hands-on, and yet I feel like I've kind of missed something where it hasn't like quite quick clicked in the way that I would expect it to. And I don't have a good answer for what that is. So that, that's something that's you know been on my I, mind. I'm looking at it and yeah. it looks, um, this material looks really uh, really interesting. Um, did, you, did you mention if this was open source? Like, would I be able to go and learn from it right now? or? Yeah, it's open source, although not like super well curated. I also have a, um, I, I worked with Joseph Bonneau, who's now a prof at New York University, and we have a YouTube playlist that I think we just, we, we had started to make a Coursera course on smart contract programming in Ethereum. And then I forget exactly what it was that happened. We ended up not releasing it through Coursera. So we have this nice like video lectures playlist that uh, I think we still need to put up on a website or do something with. We have all the recorded and edited material 
um, but haven't released it yet. Anyway, this course, for example, the smart contract course, yeah, you can get to it from my website. I think 100% uh, of the materials are just open. Um, you for that matter, even the cryptography course, um, all, of, all of the ones that you can get to from my links here should have everything online and open. So just like SOC 1024.pc.com. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to put the, the video playlist through Ben Learn because um, we're in the process now of having these pathways for students to follow uh, and to pick, you know, do you, the basics that everyone has to learn yeah. and then specializing based off, because we have students from so many different interests. Mm -hmm. Like, are you interested in, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to um, build a blockchain project? Uh, are you trying to understand it like very deeply academically, like mm -hmm. the infrastructure? Are you trying to make a business around it? Um, are you trying to like get a job in it? So you want to learn about the enterprise applications? Are you interested in DeFi, non-fungible tokens, supply chains? Um, we really want to like it to branch out and for students to be able to like pick the pathways that they want to learn. Uh, and we want it to be very video focused because you know the videos are one of the easiest ways to learn. It's also easy to translate and to have mm -hmm. that available in different languages as well. Awesome. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You're trying to like identify like uh, archetypes or goals uh, from different folks and then have like a different kind of funnel to head them down that's responsive to what they're looking to get out of it. I mean, it's a great way of structuring a bunch of learning materials. Yeah, yeah I mean, sure. like, a good thing we can use. Yeah, I, I also did want to ask about, I, I guess, evaluation methods. I guess prod a little bit more on that because I, I think what our, our goal for Ben Learn is we're trying to be that kind of one stop shop yeah. uh, for, for all blockchain education, right? Because right now, I think there's just too much of wealth of information out there and it's very confusing. I think if people had one place to go where you know they can learn the fundamentals of what blockchain is and then pick their paths on what exactly they want to learn based on what their interests are, I think it would just be a lot easier for people. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we're having difficulty on is evaluation methods, right? So like having homework and quizzes that aren't just like really easy multiple choice questions that you can Google and find on Chegg and Course Hero. Um, I guess what has kind of worked in your situations with that? Yeah, it, it's tricky. I, I, I don't think that I've done a particularly great job of making like new, uh, 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 yeah, evaluation materials. What, what I kind of got into, and I tried to experiment with this a bit, and with Joseph Beno's help, we, we did pretty well. I, I think the coolest thing that we produced is this, uh, I think really um, Joe produced most of this initially for a course at Stanford, and then you know we worked together on it and uh, got to use it here. But we did this on um, auction house uh, kind of like fill in the blanks tutorial. So you get like a template with um, portions of an auction not filled in. And it's like you work through, uh, uh, Jonathan Levy from Stanford also helped, uh, I think produce some of the initial code for this. Um, so it's basically like you have to fill in the blank solidity contracts and it goes through four different auction types like uh, Dutch auction counting down like crypto kitties, English auction where it's just always up and then like uh, commit and reveal double price, double, uh, uh, what am I saying, second price auction. Um, so you go through these different variations that are like all kind of incrementally more complicated than the other and exercise different, you know, challenges in, in blockchain building, like you have to use commit and reveal hashes for, for that one. Um, and the premise here is that because we provide this code template, we can also build um, a test framework. I don't know how clear the test framework is. Yeah, you can kind of see bits of it here. Um, and this was, we, we did this several years ago. There's, I think, better testing frameworks even available. So, I mean, we had to basically build test cases into Solidity. It was like super hard to do, um, but we got it to work. And so we were able to basically download all of the students completed filled in the blank contracts and run them against all the automatic tests and just automatically give them at least, you know, 10 out of 10 passing. Um, some of the other, you know, variations of this that we tried, um, I think I had three assignments in the smart contracts course and I thought that they were pretty cool. Um, maybe, I don't know if the Merkle tree one is like actually available. Uh, yeah, I can probably click on this and then, yeah, you should see this. You probably can't get to this Piazza page but I can show you the text. And if I go load up the contracts in Etherscan then they should stay there unless they've reset the test network. But no, that's still good. Um, so, I mean, to me, the opportunity of smart contracts is so cool is like, what does completing an assignment mean? Well, completing an assignment on smart contracts should mean that you are going and interacting with an actual smart contract on one of the public test networks. 
anything else is just, uh, you know, if there's not a transaction log, it didn't happen. So like, what else would you expect other than to go uh, do that there? So I have these handful of assignments that are either, um, I mean, this one was pretty cool. So this is an assignment meant to teach Merkle trees or test your understanding of Merkle trees. It gives you some checks, partial checksums even that are helpful so you can tell if you're on the right path. And um, it, this is basically a puzzle contract, like all evaluations could be written in the form of a puzzle contract. So there's only one way that you can complete this challenge. There's a fixed data set, which is the, uh, it looks like the beginning of the Satoshi white paper, broken down into 16 chunks. And so the only way that you can, like you're done when you get this challenge completed event to emit, like if you do that, it's it. The only way to do that is like you get a random challenge of one of the leaves of that, you know, 16 leaves based on current block in your address, something like that. The only way to do that is for you to figure out how to, you know, provide a Merkle tree branch that uh, satisfies the Merkle tree check. So technically this is like a, you know, simple proof of data possession, you know, almost like what something like Filecoin does in you know, 120 lines of Solidity code. So I love this. A lot of students were able to do it. Um, so I don't think that there was any fundamental problem there. I think that this would probably need to be expanded and commented a little bit better before it were fit for mass consumption. But I, you know, I think the gist of the idea there was pretty cool. And then I think there was an even simpler version of it. Um, that was like the homework three. Homework one was I think a pretty shitty one we should have done a better job of because it was just, um, intro to solidity syntax and some other existing things like loom network and crypto zombies or whatever i think better just very low level tutorials to that the other cool assignment though let me see if i can find where it went um because there's no link but it's just on piazza so i probably should be able to get to it from here um but it was, it was similar it was also like a contract that's online um and here i don't want to go click on everyone's Final grades. Let me see how I can. How do I this? Yeah, here's all I meant to say, I think. Um, Is this the one that sucks too? No, maybe I didn't have this in this class, but I had another one that was like the only way to win, and you can almost fill in also like what the thing should be, but the only way to win the, the, the other assignment that I had along those lines was you had to write your own smart contract that you put online next to an existing smart contract. So it was something like, not really an exploit of vulnerability, but it was like, you need to invoke a method a hundred times in a single transaction. And so you can't do that just by sending a transaction that goes to that contract endpoint. The only way to do it is to write your own repeater contract and then make a transaction that calls that code. So it's kind of like you have to write your own smart contract code just to trigger this event that you need to trigger and that's it. Yeah, that's a, a decent way to, to test if you, you have like a pre-existing smart contract um, and then the student has to interact with it in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, that's the gist of it. Yeah, I like that because for us, um, that also kind of goes along well with uh, the, the reward because we want to get into, uh, right now it's like manual. Like we have the form, they submit the form. It's either like a GitHub that they have to submit or it's a either a, a blog post they have to write to show that they conceptually understand the lesson. We don't really like the multiple choice stuff. I feel like yeah. you can, one person gets it right and then everyone after that mysteriously gets it right, right? And we all know what's going on. Um, so having these more like interacting with smart contracts, uploading stuff like on GitHub, or I think that that's better. And also you can integrate the rewards into it. So like they can be earning Bencoin automatic through automatic triggers or they can mm -hmm. get blockchain certificates issued out through automatic triggers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that is a really engaging uh, way to do it. I mean, I imagine that there's kind of a conceptual overhead of just getting started. Like, okay, even to get started, you have to go, you know, get these tools to work, have to use MetaMask. But I mean, once you get through there, I think it's a pretty, you know, natural, it can be a gradual learning curve. It can be kind of incremental discovery. And I think the reward of being able to see it and it's on this website and it's not going away and you can share the link and everyone you know, can see that you had done it. Um, I think all of those aspects you know, have the potential to make it really engaging and uh, yeah, desirable basically. 
I, I think that, um, what do you all think of like crypto zombies? I mean, that, that was, I think, uh, roughly the coolest thing along those lines. Uh, I think that was also not really so much focused on interacting with public test networks, which I think is, a, I think is better, but it, you know, it still is like kind of guided uh, learn programming language. Yeah, crypto zombies is really good. Um, I haven't tried it in a while. You said it was on mainnet or? I mean, I actually think that it is basically the equivalent of only running in like the in browser. Uh, oh, like a local network. Um, so it's not, um, oh, okay. you know, it, it's not. And, and to me, the biggest thing that was missing, again, just based on uh, the parts of this that I find interesting are my education goals. Like, so to me, I always want to tie it into computer security. So uh, I will try to do razzle dazzle if here's a cool crypto kitties auction, but then I'm going to end up wanting to talk about, you know, what effect erase conditions have. What happens if you don't do like the salt for your commitment well and someone can brute force the thing that you're trying to you know keep hidden uh so to me i'm always kind of, kind of veering off to the the computer security aspects or cryptography aspects that's not a bad thing yeah well, well um i i really like the look of your courses and uh Eric, maybe uh, if we can figure out some next steps for uh, working together with this, it'd probably be super valuable. Um, we don't have anything like this right now, so. Um, yeah, I, I think as, as Zane was talking about, right, like one of our big goals is really streamlining the process of being the one-stop shop. Um, one of the shortcomings of the Ben Wiki, which is something that we have now, is that it has all of the lessons and all of the resources, right? So if you go to like the Bitcoin page, you'll see mm -hmm. Bitcoin 101, as taught by MIT, as Bitcoin 101 from Blockchain at Berkeley, Bitcoin 101 from Michigan, Bitcoin 101. A lot of different 101s. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different Bitcoin 101s. And so even just aggregating it all together and having everyone submit their own version of the same lesson, that that's just going to be overwhelming. So we're still keeping that, right? And I think because it's good to like give that optionality, especially mm -hmm. when it's more of like a teacher that's designing their own course, because then they can pick and choose like, oh, hey, like, you know, the way MIT teaches it, is the way that we would want to teach it. So I think yeah. it's still a good resource, but yeah, we're definitely all about, can we make the Ben Learn platform as a companion portal that has you know, selected lessons, like selected mm -hmm. pathways, like, okay, this is the Bitcoin 101 video that you should watch. Um, and the first section is going to be, as you mentioned, because there's a lot of like onboarding that needs to happen. So we actually want the first, the first pathway to be like setting up MetaMask, switching to the XDI network, like understanding some of these things that you'll need just to get set up to then learn the lessons, to earn the rewards and to participate. You know, I mean, so I, I, th I think that there, you're basically pointing to like, it's, it's desirable often to have a single point of entry or point of access for, you know, many of you, like if you have a best intro 101, then like point everyone to that. Um, I mean, my personal style is, you know, fairly frantic and I like reading like five different versions of the same thing. And then I'll get a little bit from both of them and kind of triangulate and, and you know, find one that works. So, I mean, my, my style tends to be to present a whole bunch of different ones and say, you know, look, read the first paragraph of all of them and then read the rest of the one whose first paragraph you like the most. So, I mean, I, I actually think that there is a lot of value. And I also think that everyone like you know, every student has a hundred tabs open on their browser. So like, I don't think it's that overwhelming to see these as long as it's clearly labeled that, okay, you're not supposed to go one by one through all 20 of these intro videos. You're supposed to, you know, somehow find your way guided to one of them and then stick with it. So, I mean, I, I would hope that, yeah, it, it does make sense to have a bunch available, especially if it can be presented in a way that, it, you know, it's not so overwhelming. I think that that's kind of clear, you know, here, here too, like, you know, looking at this, I can tell that it's not a sequence because these are all from different names and it's clear from the titles that they are all Bitcoin 101. Um, yeah. Yeah, it definitely just needs more like tagging and, and some organizational structure. That's why we kind of formed the education committee to kind of focus on doing this. Um, and then also kind of works out that they can also do the Ben Learn to pick the best ones or the recommended ones to kind of show in a video format. Because I do think there's something about, um, it's a little difficult to gamify uh, on a wiki, right? The, there's limits to like, I think having tiles, having buttons, having embedded videos, I think that all of that really helps. Um, but yeah, on the wiki, I mean, we have like all of our partners and links to partner content as well. I think there's a lot of cool stuff there. These are pretty sweet. There's, 
yeah, it's just, just all the stuff that was created in the past. Um, and most of it is by created by students too. So I think that that's a good way to get students involved. It's like, hey, look, like the lessons that you create uh, will be live on the Ben website used by students from all around the world, be translated into other languages. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I really like the, um, I love seeing this. This is actually a great sequence of uh, things. Uh, I like this one quite a lot. Yeah, I think Extrapy has been a very great partner for us. We, we hosted them at an event, a Solidity 101 event very recently at a, I think it was Rutgers and another university. And they wanna do more. They wanna do more sessions focused on cryptography. Um, so we wanna also, you know, the content that's here that students can go and learn online. We also wanna coordinate more live in-person sessions at universities. And mm -hmm. that, even, that, that even reduces the work for clubs because they don't have to worry about bringing people in. They can just, uh, you know, work with us and then through our network, find speakers to come in and present about these topics. Oh, that is very cool. When you, you mentioned um, something I found interesting, like accredited classes, and I guess I wanted to understand what you, what you meant by that. Um, I mean, at least, uh, yeah, from my, my observation, it's really like you would want to try to get something that appeals to, you know, faculty members. So any, any professor at a university is kind of able to create their own courses to some degree, maybe not every semester, but there's pretty low friction to say, oh, I want to do an experimental course for undergrads or for grad students. Uh, it's easy for me in my department to propose that and then you know do such a course. That's one reason why we have so many here. But I think a lot of these computer science departments are, are like that. So um, I would kind of expect different materials might be useful for a prof who wants to start a new experimental course. But similarly, they would benefit from any online material that's available, especially like, um, you know, every professor is probably capable and will enjoy making like a half semester work of in, worth of intro slides because it's relatively quick. And if you've already been you know, doing some research on it, then I have those explanations mostly ready. Um, so it's like next to impossible to go create new uh, assignments and evaluation methods because that requires all this code and infrastructure. So I would bet that any sort of like assignments that are readily available would like fit very well with new um, yeah, professors wanting to uh, uh, teach something that way. Yeah, exactly. I think with uh, with the accredited courses, I mean, part of like what we learn from here, we kind of then, it's a little messy. Like we, it depends on the university. And so we have a couple of different things going on. Um, and so for example, like we're working with the University College of the Cayman Islands right now through a partnership that we have with the Caribbean Blockchain Alliance that they introduce us to them. And so we've been working with their staff and faculty and we put together a course that we got approved. So the course is gonna be taught uh, online in the summer and then it's okay. gonna be taught again in the fall and it's gonna be in the fall, it's gonna be for college credit. So students will earn college credit. Right. So we, so we by brought accredited, in a couple, Do you just mean that you get credit for the course? I yeah, by credit, I mean that the students get college credits for it. All right. Yeah, I got it. Um, Cause that's a gap. There's a gap there that, you know, students, being a part of the club is you exactly can get you a job, you can get all the stuff, but you know, if you have to also do classes, that's a lot. So yep. can we get accredited courses so that students are actually earning college credit? So yeah, so, so we're working with them now and it's really interesting because we learned a lot from the education committee meetings when we put together the syllabus. In fact, in the actual course, um, Blockchain at Berkeley's course that they taught mm -hmm. uh, at their seminar is required reading. So in the each in the syllabus, you see their links to their videos as as required videos to watch. Um, so it works because you know then their content kind of lives on and is being taught at another university. But there's also the live element, so it's not just like playing the videos in class because that would get mm -hmm. really boring after a while. Um, but it's like it's a remix of the course that was taught at Berkeley, mixed in with like the stuff from other courses. There's a couple of stuff from uh, some University of Florida lectures that are in there. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, getting the courses in different universities, it depends. Because some other other courses, some other universities that we're working with now, um, we're working with an EY-based curriculum. So a curriculum that was put together by EY, and we're working on that. Right. Um, so it depends on what, yeah, it depends on what the students are trying to learn. We kind of just put it together for a particular university. There's no like one, like, oh, this is a Ben course and we're getting this installed at every university. It's more like on a case by case basis. Got it. Uh, that's a cool, uh, cool way to do it. Okay, are there any other questions?